Chapter 3, Shoot to Thrill, The Psychology of Sniping. The psychology of sniping is the psychology of fear. John Falk, a journalist who worked in sniper-infested Sarajevo, described it best. <clears throat> knowing a sniper is loose is like knowing a cobra is at large somewhere in your house. It makes you paranoid. It freezes you. You stop walking by beds, couches, you open drawers. One is left with the eerie sensation that instant death is always just a moment away. People who live under the fear of snipers lose track of everything in the world but their fear. It is very dark that these gunmen have on it is a very dark hole that these gunmen have on the regions they terrorize. That's why if captured, snipers are almost always executed on the spot. It is also the reason why most armies disband their sniper units immediately after a war. Snipers are spooky, even to the people they serve. There is something absolutely terrifying about knowing that a lone, skilled gunman is in the area, possibly placing the crosshairs on your head at any moment. This makes people think, and when people think, they think about saving themselves. Sniper-conscious people take less risks and play it safe. In a war zone, where soldiers and police officers are paid to do dangerous work, playing it safe means you no longer do your job. In 1993, British forces working in South Armagh, Northern Ireland, were gripped with sniper fear. During this time, an Irish Republican Army sniper team worked the area and in nine separate sniper attacks killed seven British soldiers. Some British units were so afraid of being the next victim, they stopped doing their jobs. In fact, one Royal Scots platoon was disciplined because instead of manning a vehicle checkpoint like they were supposed to, they stayed inside the safety of their base and falsified the registrations of the vehicles that they were responsible for checking. In this case, the fear of being shot by a sniper overcame military discipline and, in effect, ceded the surrounding area to the IRA. A subsequent summary of operations in Northern Ireland, written by the British Army in 2006, admitted the effects of IRA snipers. Republican information operations, such as the sniper at work signs, combined with media hype, helped build the myth of the sniper. The attacks affected security force operations and had an impact on morale among some troops and police officers serving in South Armagh. A guerrilla sniper can also have a significant impact on a larger civilian population. A perfect example of this was the murderous sniping spree committed by the DC snipers, John Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo. During the fall of 2002, Muhammad and Malvo stalked the greater Washington, D.C. region, killing people at random over a geographically large area in order to spread a web of terror. No one was safe. Small children were targeted, as were old men and women. Over the course of several weeks, the D.C. snipers struck fear in the hearts of tens of, tens of thousands of people, as entire towns changed their daily habits to avoid the random death lurking the streets. People stocked up on food, children remained at home, and unknown numbers of tourists stayed away. Persistent rumors even spread that Muslim gunmen loyal to Al-Qaeda were responsible for the slaughter. The sniper's second goal, overreaction. While one goal of a sniper is to instill fear in the hearts of their enemies in order to paralyze and degrade their every move, a second objective is to manipulate this fear into an overreaction. As John Falk described, snipers are not only feared, they are hated. While fighting on the Eastern Front against the Russians in World War II, German sniper Sepp Allerberger was able to elicit a murderous reaction from the opposing Red Army. On April 2, 1945, the night he won the Knight's Cross, Sepp showed the kind of sniping that drove the Russians mad for revenge. On that night, Sepp was on patrol with an infantry squad. The sky was pitch black when a Russian flare suddenly turned the night into day, exposing Sepp and his patrol. Most of the patrol was quickly wiped out by Russian machine gun fire, leaving Sepp alone to face a Russian infantry company. The Russians then attacked the decimated German patrol in two separate waves. However, the assaulting Russians did not realize Sepp was still alive until he opened fire at a range of only 80 meters, striking the startled Red Army soldiers with explosive bullets. Sepp intentionally aimed at a spot just above the Russians' hips, so his bullets exploded inside their stomachs and intestines. 
After Sepp mowed down the assaulting infantry with well-aimed fire, he turned his attention to the remaining Russians still in their trenches. He targeted the closest machine gun nest located about 100 meters away. By now, the Russian machine gun team knew exactly where he was located, but the two bodies of Seth's fallen comrades protected him from the incoming bullets. Despite the enemy fire, Seth took careful aim and placed an exploding bullet in the machine gunner's head and the head of his belt feeder. Every so often, a Russian soldier would expose himself in the trench and Seth would put a bullet in his brain. In the course of 10 minutes, Seth killed all 18 of the Russian soldiers who once occupied the trench. There were another 50 dead sprawled out across the open field. With rifle work like this, it was unsurprising that the Russians, already prone to brutality, were in less than a charitable mood when capturing a German sniper. Sepp described an instance when a young German sniper was captured by the Russians. This sniper went out to go hunting, but never returned. Four days later, a German patrol came across his body. Sepp believes the Russians captured the German sniper with his rifle, which had notches cut in the stock for all the kills he made. The Russians cut the sniper all over his body, cut his balls off, and stuffed them in his mouth, and then stuck the barrel of the rifle up his rectum, all the way back to the site. After encountering horrible incidents like this, Sepp became a guerrilla sniper hiding among the larger population of regular German soldiers. Seb stopped cutting notches in the stock of his rifle for every Russian he sent to the grave. He refused to wear the issued sniper badge depicting a raven's head and three oak leaves, and if it appeared that capture was imminent, Seb ditched his sniper rifle and carried the more innocuous MP40 submachine gun. Seb strived to avoid any outward appearance of being a sniper to become anonymous. This way, he might actually live if captured by the Russians. In guerrilla war, the rage and anger a deadly sniper like Stepp Alberger brings out in the enemy can be used to advance the guerrilla's cause. This is because the security forces being killed one at a time by an invisible shooter are just as likely to turn their pent-up frustrations on the civilian population as they are at the actual shooter. The United States Field Manual, Combined Arms Operations in Urban Terrain, recognizes this problem in their chapter on sniping. Historically, Units that suffered heavy and continual casualties from urban sniper fire and were frustrated by their inability to strike back effectively often have become enraged. Such units may overreact and violate the laws of land warfare concerning the treatment of captured snipers. This tendency is magnified if the unit has been under intense stress of combat fire for an extended time. It is vital that commanders and leaders at all levels understand the laws of land warfare and also understand the psychological pressures of urban warfare. It requires strong leadership and great moral strength to prevent soldiers from releasing their anger and frustration on captured snipers or civilians suspected of sniping at them. Since a central part of any guerrilla war is winning the support of the population, government forces that indiscriminately kill, injure, or inconvenience the civilian population in order to get a sniper will only turn the people against them. The same is true for government forces that carelessly destroy the surrounding urban infrastructure and blow up buildings, destroy bridges, and tear up roads. Therefore, a guerrilla sniper that induces fear in their enemy and causes an overreaction that results in the mass detention of innocent people and costly damage to the urban landscape advances their movement by creating the conditions that turn public opinion against the government. The Franks Terrors and the Franco-German Wars an example of the power of overreaction took place during the 1870 through 1871 Franco-Prussian War when Frank Terrors, French partisan forces, fought against the invading Prussian forces. The French partisans, which grew from French civilian gun clubs created in the 1860s, were intended to provide the French government with a corps of trained marksmen in case of war. When Prussia invaded France in 1870, the French partisans, fighting in civilian garb, fought a guerrilla war against the Prussian troops, relying heavily on guerrilla sniper tactics to pick off unsuspecting Prussian soldiers and to tie down large numbers of the invaders. The French guerrillas were such feared marksmen that the Spanish and Portuguese words for sharpshooter, Franco Tirador in Spanish and Franco Atirador in Portuguese, were derived from the word Frank Tirador. In response, the Prussian army considered the Frank Tureurs dishonorable assassins and executed all captured snipers and other guerrillas on the spot. The Prussians argued that the Frank Tureurs 
by fighting in civilian clothes violated the norms of warfare and could be killed just like one would kill a spy. But the invading Prussians did more than just kill Frank Tureurs. They also employed widespread reprisals against entire villages and towns suspected of harboring the guerrillas. These reprisals, which included mass detentions, pillaging, and the burning of private residences, bred a long-lasting hatred between the French people and the Prussians. The Prussian military command, seriously frustrated by the Frank Tureurs during the war, believed that through even stricter population control measures and mass punishment could the problem be solved. Consequently, when World War I arrived with a terrible thunder in 1914, the invading German army, who found themselves plagued once again with accurately shooting Frank Tureurs, reverted to harsh pacification measures against the Belgian and French civilian populations. As before, these measures only served to alienate the Belgian and French people, turning them ever more resolutely against the German invader. The byproduct of the escalating Franz Tirol's German pacification war was an increasingly entrenched hatred for the German invaders, who were derisively called the Boches or the Hun after the barbaric conquerors from the east. Due in part to this hatred generated from German mistreatment of French civilians during the Great War, France and the other victorious nations enacted their own revenge on the German people with the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. The German army may have subjected large swaths of Western Europe to their repressive counter guerrilla measures during the Great War, but eventual France imposed an even harsher post-war sentence on the entire German nation, which included a humiliating demilitarization of the fatherland. Allied control of Germany's vital industrial rural area and absolutely crippling war reparation payments. These measures shattered the German state's self-esteem, destroyed the German economy, and created a chaotic environment that led to a low-grade civil war. Out of this toxic, bubbling cauldron of fear, hate, and loathing came a most unlikely savior, Adolf Hitler. Through the Fuhrer, the resuscitated German people unflinchingly tunneled their two decades of humiliation, disgrace, and misery. With a vengeance, the Nazi phoenix righted past wrongs, steamrolling sacrificial Poland in 1939 and crushing hated France under the steel treads of German panzers in the summer of 1940. And yet again, Western Europe, and particularly France, responded with guerrilla warfare. Just as with the Franco-Prussian War and the Great War, German occupation forces responded with increasingly repressive counterinsurgency tactics. This time, the war was different. As Germany now had the Gestapo, which employed such brutal counterinsurgency experts like Klaus Barbie, who tried to beat, execute, and torture the French population into submission. Captured French resistors were also dumped into the German Tote organization, where they were worked to the bone as forced labor. If digging ditches for the Reich failed to cure the will to resist, more permanent measures might work, like being thrown into the giant maw of the comprehensive system of concentration camps and slaughterhouses that devoured millions of resistors and enemies of the state, from suspected guerrillas and communists to Jews and the mentally retarded. After the Third Reich's final defeat in 1945, the Allies learned they made a serious mistake after World War I by punishing Germany, but leaving her people to their own devices. This time, with the horrors of the Holocaust firmly in mind, the Allies decided to occupy a castrate Germany, occupy and castrate Germany, ensuring a new militant Germany did not rise from the ashes of the former Nazi state. As of the writing of this book, the Allies' post-war strategy worked. In this example, the use of guerrilla snipers, begun in the Franco-Prussian War, contributed to an inseparable chain of events fueled by spiraling hatreds that contributed to the greatest bloodbath the world had ever seen. Amplifying fear, amplifying reaction. A sniper's effectiveness is multiplied tenfold when their enemy thinks they are a greater threat than they actually are. For example, we read earlier in this chapter about the British platoon in Northern Ireland that stopped doing their jobs because of sniper fear. Most likely, the platoon had no specific information that an IRA sniper team was singling them out. However, because several other soldiers over the course of several months were hit, fear of attack was enough for them to give up on carrying out their duties. The IRA's campaign of sniper intimidation was aided immensely by a publicity campaign involving road signs showing the silhouette of a sniper in the words, Sniper at Work, painted below. The Sniper at Work signs 
greeted British soldiers as they went on foot patrols and drove their vehicles in IRA-dominated areas in Northern Ireland. These signs, some of which were booby-trapped to prevent their removal, reminded the British they were entering IRA sniper country. In reality, relatively few British soldiers were killed by IRA snipers. However, the British thought the threat was greater, and this was enough to put an enormous drag on all their operations like a lot, giant lead anchor, allowing the IRA a much greater freedom of movement than they deserved. The Cult of Sniperism The Myth of Vasily Zaitsev Like the modern IRA, the Russians of World War II understood the power of promoting their sniping efforts, and the single greatest feat of sniper propaganda is without doubt the myth surrounding Russian sniper Vasily Zaitsev and his supposed duel with the Germans' best sniper during the Battle of Stalingrad. To understand the power of this myth, one must first understand the circumstances surrounding the battle. Up until the Battle of Stalingrad, which ended in February 1943, the German Wehrmacht, armed forces, mauled the Soviet Union as a vicious wolverine would savage a giant ponderous bear. During the course of this mauling, the Red Army and Soviet people suffered losses on a scale never seen before in the history of warfare. By the time the German Sixth Army could see Stalingrad's skyline in the fall of 1942, millions of Russian soldiers had already been killed and seriously wounded in combat, millions more languished in Spartan POW camps, and millions of Russian civilians were executed, starved to death, or simply obliterated by the German war machine. Taking into account this grim situation, the Soviet Union needed a psychological victory. They needed a hero. By sheer chance, young Vasily Zaitsev, a Navy payroll clerk who grew up hunting wild game in the Ural Mountains to feed his family, became this hero. No one in the Russian army knew that Zaitsev was an excellent shot, and nor that day, one day, he would become an expert urban sniper. The Russian leadership literally stumbled across Zaitsev when stories about a short, tough seaman who was picking off Germans finally reached their ears. General Shuikov, commander of the reeling Russian forces in Stalingrad, knew his hard-pressed men needed inspiration, so he promoted and pu publicized Zaitsev's exploits. Shuikov's decision to exploit Zaitsev's sniper success led to the creation of what the Russians called the cult of sniperism. Shuikov intentionally encouraged the development of a Russian sniper corps in Stalingrad, and he wanted more snipers like Zaitsev fighting in his ranks. As a result of the guidance, Zaitsev started an urban sniper school in the ruins of Stalingrad and eventually trained scores of students that either equaled or surpassed his sniping skills and total enemy body count. By the height of the battle for Stalin City, the Russians had a large, trained sniper corps inflicting significant daily losses on the Germans. While the cult of sniperism had real bite to it, Zaitsev and his sniper corps were larger than life in the Russian media. Moscow radio shows trumpeted Zaitsev's success to the Russian people, giving them faith in the fight against the Nazi invaders. Red Army newspapers gloated as Zaitsev's body count grew by leaps and bounds. Soviet propaganda units in Stalingrad cranked out crudely inked flyers glorifying Zaitsev's sniper prowess and distributed them by the armloads to their frontline troops, which found their way to the Germans who suffered under his crosshairs. The sniper duel that never was. Zaitsev's popularity hit its zenith with the much-publicized duel between him and a German sniper who was supposedly sent to Stalingrad to take him out. According to the Russians, the German Wehrmacht, who were professionally and publicly humiliated by Zaitsev's sniper successes, sent their chief instructor from the sniper school at Zossen, located near Berlin, into the crumbling city of Stalingrad to settle the score. The story of this most famous duel was told by Zaitsev himself in his memoirs, Notes of a Sniper. In Vasily's tale, a team of Russian scouts captured a German soldier for the explicit purpose of interrogating him for battlefield information. The Russians referred to these kind of prisoners as tongues because their sole purpose was to talk. This frightened prisoner indeed talked to save his life and told his captors the German high command had flown in their best sniper, a Major Konings, who head of the sniper school near Berlin, was tasked with the mission to take out Zaitsev. Now that Zaitsev knew the German super sniper was in the city, Zaitsev had to find him just as he assumed the German was looking for him. Zaitsev took his usual 
thorough approach, trying to detect a pattern from how his own Russian comrades were being shot and wounded in the city. After no luck, he finally had a breakthrough. In one day, two of the Russians' best snipers were targeted by a sniper. One sniper was shot and wounded, and the other had his rifle scope shattered. The next day, Zaitsev and his partner, Kulikov, went to the scene of the sniper attack to see if the German shooter was still around. While they surveyed the German lines, they saw a German helmet appear in a trench line and bob along the ditch. However, the movement of the helmet looked unnatural, as if it was placed on top of a stick. Zaitsev knew this was a trap. Konings must have had his assistant present the helmet to get Zaitsev to shoot at it, thus revealing Zaitsev's position and making him vulnerable to Koning's own shot. Instead, Zaitsev and Kulikov snuck off under the protection of darkness in order to think of a plan. The two went back to the same location the second day, and after hours of careful surveillance, they still saw nothing. They assumed Konings was still lying in wait somewhere, conducting his own surveillance against them, hoping they would make a mistake and expose themselves. On the third day of their stakeout, the two were accompanied by a political officer named Danilov. As they scanned the rubble, Danilov thought he spotted Konings and rose out of his trench to point him out to Zaitsev. As soon as he did, Konings shot Danilov, but only wounded him. Still, Zaitsev could not figure out where Konings was hiding. Zaitsev continued to study the urban terrain, making notes as he looked for a clue of where he might be. Zaitsev finally deduced where the shot came from, directly in front of their position. In front of them were only three possible sniper positions, a burned-out tank, a pillbox, and a sheet of iron. Zaitsev guessed Koning was under the sheet of iron in the shadows underneath it, completely invisible. To test this theory, Zaitsev raised, raised his mitten on a piece of wood. A shot rang out, piercing the mitten and small board. Zaitsev inspected the wood, noticing the bullet entered it from straight on where the iron sheet was. Zaitsev decided to stay in place for another night. He would try and get Konings the next day. The next day, Zaitsev and Kulikov scouted the terrain again. Then, as the sun shone brightly above, they saw a glimmer of light reflecting off of something under the sheet of iron, perhaps a rifle scope. Kulikov tried to lure out Konings by raising his own helmet carefully above his position. Bang! A shot rang out, striking the helmet. Kulikov, the cons consummate actor, screamed out in agony and collapsed to the ground in imaginary death. Zaitsev, in turn, fired under the iron sheet, striking Konings, killing him. Later that night... Zaitsev and Kulikov went to Koning's position and recovered his rifle and identification papers, turning them over to their command. This story has since become the most repeated tale in the history of sniping until it has been accepted as gospel by many historians and sniper enthusiasts. General Chuikov himself repeated this exact story in his 1959 book, The Battle for Stalingrad. Since Shuikov's book is critical of the Russians' own failures and gives due credit to the German war machine, his citing of the Zaitsev story gave it considerable credence. William Craig's 1973 work, Enemy at the Gates, repeats the same story as if repeating some sort of religious doctrine. In 1999, David L. Robbins published his novel, War of the Rats, a fictional account of the events leading up to the duel between Zaitsev and Konings. Only two years later, in 2001, the movie Enemy at the Gates hit the theaters, billed as the true story of the now famous sniper duel between Zaitsev and his German nemesis. To top it off, John Plaster repeats a shortened version of the same story in his 2006 book, The Ultimate Sniper. I have no doubt many people who read these books or saw the movie also believe the story Zaitsev himself printed in his book Notes of a Sniper. The only problem with this story is it never happened. Yes, Zaitsev did shoot it out with a German sniper. He shot it out with many German snipers. However, the supposed duel between Zaitsev and a German super sniper is pure propaganda. There are many reasons why, as an investigator, looking at the tale with a critical eye, would find the story less than convincing. While we could write an entire chapter as to why this yarn does not hold any water, here are some of the most salient reasons. It is unlikely the German high command, fighting a costly war in North Africa, worried about an invasion of France, 
and taking astronomical losses all along the Eastern Front, would get so involved as to make the decision to send one man, their best sniper instructor, to Stalingrad. And there's absolutely no official or personal documentation anywhere supporting this happened. No one, either Russian or German, has proven a major Konings ever existed. If he did die in combat, the German army would have issued a death notice and sent official documents to his family. This never happened. German officers were not snipers. Enlisted men were. It is statistically improbable two individual snipers fighting in a 20-mile-long city caught in between two armies equaling more than 100,000 men could find each other to duel. The German that Zaisev supposedly shot was not a skilled sniper. He stayed in an isolated position for too long. He fell for Zaitsev's obvious ruses and failed to detect Zaitsev's own predictable trap. In short, he did everything that Zaitsev said a good sniper would never do. Some researchers claim the Germans really sent SS Stardenfuhrer Heinz Thorwald to kill Zaitsev. Again, there is no proof of this anywhere. SS colonels were not snipers, and this additional name reveals yet another inconsistency in the story. The Russians say a German prisoner told the Germans were sending a sniper to get Zaitsev. How did this soldier know? Did someone tell him personally? It was a common knowledge in the German ranks. There is no evidence of this ever happening except word of mouth from the Russians. Zaitsev said he took the personal documents from the German sniper's body and gave them to his superiors. The Russians also say they have the scope from the German sniper in a museum, but where are these supposed documents? The Russians' propaganda machine spun this story so aggressively and consistently that even today many people accept this account as fact. This is exactly what the Russians wanted. They wanted to create the image of a perfect sniper who was always victorious and triumphed over evil no matter what the odds. In this sense, the story of the famous duel was an analogy for the larger Battle of Stalingrad. Just as Zaitsev, the humble Siberian shepherd, was able to beat the best the Aryan race had to offer, the Russians' ragtag army in Stalingrad soundly beat the mighty German 6th Army. The story of Zaitsev's duel was really a story of the whole Russian army, the entire Russian people. Zaitsev was Russia. One must appreciate what the Russian propaganda machine accomplished. They made it seem, to both Russian and German troops alike, there was a Russian sniper under every roof, in every trench, behind every bush, patiently waiting and waiting for each and every German soldier in the entire Wehrmacht. As a result, the Russians instilled fear in the average German soldier, making the German soldier sniper conscious throughout the rest of the war. While we can admire the Russian success in the field of sniper psychology, one has to wonder at the German failure. Why do the Germans fail to promote their own sniper movement in order to instill fear in their enemies? Germany and Sniping there were many reasons why the Germans did not embrace the cult of sniperism like the Red Army did. The primary reasons were institutional. The German Wehrmacht was a combined arms war machine, and the lone sniper did not figure in their larger calculations. The Panzer Divisions and the Luftwaffe were the champions of the Wehrmacht, not the lowly Scharsenschutz. <laughs> While the Rifleman was given due respect, most were not national heroes. Many wartime Germans knew who Michael Whitman was, the blonde, handsome panzer commander credited with being the most successful tank commander in the history of war, destroying hundreds of enemy tanks, artillery pieces, and armored vehicles. Equally famous was unrepentant Nazi Hans Ulrich Rudel, a Struka dive bomber pilot who destroyed over 2,000 ground targets and won the diamonds to the Knight's Cross. And the German people knew very well the name of Erich Hartmann, called the Black Devil of the Ukraine by his enemies, a dashing fighter pilot with 352 confirmed kills. But whoever heard of Matthias Heitzenhauer, a German sniper with the 3rd Gebersdring Division? Heitzenhauer had at least 345 confirmed kills during the war and probably several hundred unconfirmed kills. Sepp Allerberger had 257 confirmed kills and most likely a total body count of 500. These men got a pat on the back from their fellow soldiers who appreciated their dirty work. They were eventually awarded a cheap cloth sniper badge for their efforts in 1944, and some were recommended for a higher award if they pulled off a particularly spectacular feat like the night Allerberger wiped out an entire Russian infantry company to the last man. There were no front page headlines for these men who did the most dangerous of jobs. 
As a result, the German people were not inspired by the actions of these men, and the Russians did not live in fear of them. German snipers were like a tree falling in the forest with no one to hear them. An unlikely supporter for a more robust German sniper program was the Reichsfuhrer of the SS, Heinrich Himmler. Although the bookish Himmler had no experience in sniping himself, he saw its value. In a letter Himmler sent to Albert Speer, dated December 18, 1944, Himmler expressed some of his views about the overall German sniping effort. Dear party member Speer, perhaps you have already heard that I'm encouraging and accelerating snap shooting training in the Grenadier Divisions. We have already attained outstanding results. I have initiated a contest between all divisions of the Army and the SS that are under my command. With the 50th confirmed sharpshooter hit, that is, when he has virtually eliminated a Soviet infantry company, each man receives a wristwatch from me and reports to my field headquarters. With the 100th hit, he receives a hunting rifle, and with the 150th, he is invited by me to go hunting to shoot a stag or chamois buck. The heavy requirements of snap shooting underlies my following representation. Per experience, it is entirely possible that a division can affect at least 200 hits a month. I have several divisions which have attained 3 and 400 hits. Suppose there are only 100 divisions on the entire Eastern Front. There are significantly more. That would mean 20,000 dead foes in one month. It should be taken into consideration that these fallen foes belong to fighting infantry, not to the supply lines, the artillery, or the rear support services. The Soviet Rifle Division today has two infantry regiments of 12 companies with 50 men each, in all about 1,200 men. 20,000 dead foes per month, by means of sharpshooter hits, means the elimination of the infantry of almost 17 rifle divisions, a result we cannot obtain more effectively, and, if you prefer, more expensively, with the employment of the least amount of armament. From this, however, it is necessary that we obtain more sharpshooter rifles. I would be very grateful if you could step up the production of telescopic sights, rifles with telescopic sights, and perhaps also machine carbines with telescopic sights as soon as possible. Signed, Himmler. Any support for a more aggressive sniper program was a good thing for the Wehrmacht, but Himmler appreciated the sniper corps for statistical, not psychological reasons. As 1945 approached the Dying Reich, Himmler thought that killing 240,000 Russians in the final year would make a dent in the Red Army. He could not have been more wrong. The Russians buried 240,000 dead a month for four months in the murderous slag heap called Stalingrad, and they still kept coming. The Russian nation as a whole, since the first hor horrible summer of 1941, lost 5 million dead a year for four years and endured. A stati statistical perspective on sniping when facing the Red Army, was doomed to failure. The Red Army, as an institution, was designed to take gigantic, near-fatal losses but survive. Like some teetering, grotesque Frankenstein with its limbs hacked off and then crudely reattached. Instead, Himmler should have written a letter not to Albert Speer, but to Joseph Goebbels, Germany's minister for popular enlightenment and propaganda who had a white-knuckled stranglehold on the German media outlets. The German sniper movement would have been better served if Goebbels' propaganda machine ran regular radio broadcast about its eagle-eyed Aryan sharpshooters and plastered running tallies of their kills on the front pages of the Reich's newspapers. Goebbels and the Wehrmacht should have copied the Soviet approach, since the spreading of fear was a more powerful tool for the severely outnumbered Reich. Ultimately, the Red Army understood the psychology of sniping far better than their German foes. Marketing the Modern Sniper Over the course of many decades and wars, no military, and certainly no guerrilla movement, equaled the Russian exploitation of sniping until the 2003 war in Iraq. While most Iraqi insurgent snipers were not exceptionally talented shooters, not one has displayed the prowess of Vasily Zaitsev or Sepp Allerberger, the Iraqi resistance did understand the psychology of sniping. In Iraq, the insurgents gave a name and an identity to their guerrilla sniper campaign, creating a single super sniper they called Juba. The insurgents cleverly attributed a variety of skillful sniper attacks to this single sniper entity who seemed to be everywhere. 
Importantly, the key to the insurgents' marketing success were their procedures for filming and then distributing their sniper attacks to an international audience. The Iraqi insurgent snipers got their film coverage by assigning a cameraman to record the sniper's attack. Most often, the shooter and the cameraman were co-located side by side. When the sniper made their shot from their concealed position, the cameraman filmed from an angle almost in line with the shooter. The cameraman was so close to the shooter that, at times, it looked like the camera was attached to the rifle. On occasion, the snipers even filmed the shootings through the scope of their rifle. The end result was a you-are-there perspective of the shooting. Getting good sniper footage was just one step in the insurgents' marketing process. The next step was getting this film into a format the hungry consumer could devour. This was easy since sniper attacks were filmed on digital cameras. After the cameraman filmed the attack and made their getaway, they went to a secure location like a safe house and hooked their camera up to a computer. Using basic, commercially available software, they downloaded, edited, and burned their footage onto compact discs, CDs. Once the insurgents burned a couple of hundred CDs, they were ready for distribution. One way to get them into the hands of the Iraqi people was to simply stand on street corners and hand them out. Or the CDs were distributed to the vast, thriving underground CD network in Iraq that sold CDs to this discriminating customer on anything fiery IED, IED attacks to gruesome beheadings. The most important venue for insurgent sniper videos was the internet. The Iraqi insurgency was media savvy enough to develop its own website that promoted the insurgency and glorified their attacks on the government and American occupation forces. If the average Iraqi citizen was unwilling to risk being caught in possession of insurgent propaganda, which may get them a painful beating by the police or even jail time, it was safer just to log onto a guerrilla website and see the video online. If the consumer watched the video in the comfort of their own home, they could always delete the web history and the internet cookies after getting their insurgency fix. If they did not want to risk having incriminating electrons hiding away somewhere in the electronic guts of their computers, they could go to an internet cafe and log on there. In Iraq, watching insurgent propaganda was like watching porn. No one would publicly condone it. It was officially outlawed by the government. But everyone did it, and the government could not stop it. Because the insurgents placed their sniper footage on internet service providers, ISPs, in neutral countries like Syria and Jordan, the Iraqi and U.S. governments were unable to control it or shut it down. Even if an ISP was shut down, it was a temporary annoyance at best, as another ISP was just a few clicks away, and an anonymous credit card away from being up and running. With the internet's global reach, insurgent sniper propaganda found itself readily available across the world and in America's own living rooms. One just had to log on to YouTube or ogreish.com to see this footage. YouTube is a particularly potent media tool because 100 million people a day log on to the site and one Iraqi insurgent sniper video which offered the interested viewer tips on how to shoot American soldiers received 30,000 hits before it was taken down. Today, anyone in the world can do a Google or dogpile search for propaganda plus sniper and find what they are looking for. Another arrow in the Iraqi insurgents' media quiver was international television. Just think of the hundreds of millions of people a day who watch the world's major news channels like America's cable news network, CNN, the British Broadcasting Company, BBC, Germany's Der Spiegel News Network, and Qatar's Al, Jaz Al Jazeera. CNN has a true global reach, and as of 2007, its news services were available to more than 1.5 billion people. If CNN was a giant in its field, then BBC was a colossus, bringing in even larger audiences through its radio shows, TV news, and internet sites. In 2007, the BBC was rated as single largest media organization, and the planet Germany's Der Spiegel operated in the shadows of media giants like CNN and BBC, but it was Germany's number one magazine with millions of readers and had its own internet site. And then there was Al Jazeera, the most influential Arab media network in the Middle East. Although it was created in 1996, Al Jazeera already reached an estimated 50 million Arab homes and 80 million English-speaking homes by 2007. 
It is important to understand the reach and influence of these media giants because each one of them aired stories and or videos of the Iraqi insurgent sniper attacks against Iraqi government and American forces. On October 18, 2006, CNN's show Anderson Cooper 360 aired a five-minute piece about Iraqi insurgent sniping, including a sniper video produced by the Islamic Army in Iraq. While the show had a huge audience, even more attention was brought to the sniper piece when the American public debated if CNN should have showed the insurgent sniper video or not. In fact, the controversy brought more coverage to the insurgent sniper operations than if there was no controversy at all. On their website, CNN explained that they showed the sniper footage. They admitted that there could be some benefit to the insurgents by airing the sniper piece and that some viewers would be upset by the graphic footage. However, CNN argued that the piece was newsworthy and important to show because of the rising casualties in Iraq, many of which were caused by snipers. Out of respect to the soldiers actually targeted in the film, CNN explained that they faded the screen to black before actually showing the impact of the sniper's round. Some readers expressed outrage at CNN's airing the sniper video, while others praised CNN for showing the American people the unvarnished truth. During the same period as the CNN piece, Der Spiegel's TV network aired a special on the Iraqi insurgent snipers that included Juba sniper footage, an interview with an American soldier wounded in that sniper attack, and then an insurgent sniper showing off his sniper equipment and explaining some of their new methods. For the German media giant, this was just another informational piece on the guerrilla war in Iraq that revealed some of the insurgents' latest tactics. Because Germany did not have any soldiers in Iraq getting shot by urban guerrilla snipers, there was no outcry from the German public and no resulting swirl of controversy. In October 2006, Al Jazeera ran a similar video showing insurgent snipers shooting U.S. soldiers. This piece included an interview with the commander of an insurgent sniper brigade who explained the impact of their sniping on the enemy. From the insurgents' perspective, it was important to get their sniper footage on a mainstream Arab news network in order to reach out to the millions of Arabs living adjacent to Iraq and Syria, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia, and the rest of the Middle East for that matter. Videos like this showed the insurgents' success against the occupiers, inspired new volunteers to come and fight in Iraq, and reassured existing supporters around the world that their moral and monetary backing was a good investment. It is significant to note that the insurgent film airing on the October 2006 Al Jazeera piece was an example of high-quality media work. In the beginning of the guerrilla war in 2003 to 2004, the Iraqi insurgents' media efforts were often of poor quality, with grainy videos and pictures pasted together haphazardly, obviously made by amateurs. By the time of the sniper video in 2006, the insurgents' media process had improved drastically as they now employed professional media experts to create, edit, exploit, and distribute slick, well-made sniper propaganda worldwide. The Iraqi insurgents showed themselves to be learning, adaptive organization that valued the art of sniping. They also understood that the impact of their attacks would be amplified exponentially if they put them in the hands of the world's media giants. Once Juba became a hero to the insurgency, other independent supporters of the resistance capitalized on this popularity to spread the myth of Juba even further. A Brazilian named Carlos Latuf made a comic book about Juba where the main character does battle with arrogant American forces and guns them down with his sniper rifle. While most websites encourage his readers to copy, download, and distribute his Juba comic book as widely as possible. Sniper Media Technology Ever since the creation of compact, portable, still, and motion picture cameras in the mid-1800s, men had the ability to photograph and film their sniper attacks. However, it was not until World War II and the Battle for Stalingrad that snipers actually began employing cameras in combination with their sniping. The Red Army, for example, took staged photos of their much-vaunted snipers gunning down supposed German soldiers in the streets of Stalingrad. In these staged photo sessions, the Russian photographer stood right over the sniper's shoulder, getting pictures of not only their falling victim, but also the shooter's rifle. From his perspective, the reader could almost believe they were holding the rifle themselves, staring down the cold barrel at a Nazi invader. During his sniping in Stalingrad, Vasily Zaitsev noticed some German snipers were actually doing one better. They photographed their targets through the scopes of their rifles. Zaitsev mentioned this in his book that a German sniper who Zaitsev eventually shot, used some sort of photographic device to take pictures through his scope. 
Unfortunately, Zaitsev makes no mention of recovering this device, and other historical accounts of German snipers never mention this practice. One can only assume the German sniper was using a personal camera attached to his rifle scope to take pictures of his targets, perhaps before and after he shot them. While any sniper anywhere in the world with a camera could do the same from World War II and on, the practice never caught on. Even Zaitsev and the Russians, who took sniper media exploitation to new levels, failed to recognize the potential for capturing their actual sniper attacks on film. Some guerrilla organizations have embraced the use of modern media technology, like the Chechen and Palestinian resistance movements, but they too failed to exploit their sniper operations to the fullest. Only with the guerrilla war in Iraq did one see an organizing using you are there footage for their sniper operations. It was the Iraqi insurgent sniper teams who first filmed their sniper attacks on a large scale in an effort to distribute them worldwide. And it was easy. All they did was have a cameraman stand shoulder to shoulder with the shooter and film the entire attack from the sniper's perspective. Again, this was easy because all it took was someone placing an inexpensive ham handheld camcorder up to the scope while taking the shot. Why it took 150 years for an organization to figure out how to exploit existing media technology and sniper operations is anyone's guess. It took an appreciation of media, modern technology, sniper operations, and guerrilla warfare to produce the latest methodology of actually filming sni sniper operations from the shooter's perspective. It just happened to be the Iraqi insurgents, for whatever reason, who finally cracked the code and figured it out. While all it takes is a person with a cheap digital video camera to film a sniper attack from the shooter's perspective, modern technology has made this task easier and more efficient. For example, Bushmaster sells a pair of 8 power binoculars that have an integral camera with LCD, liquid crystal display, screen, and 32 megabytes of internal memory, which can capture 30 seconds of video or hundreds of still photos. While these binoculars, someone can zoom in on a target, record an attack, and then download the video pictures with the USB cable, all for about $500. The advantage of using the binocular cam is that it is rugged, has good zooming ability, and does not look like a camera. Another option is the helmet-mounted camera, helmet cam that has been used for years by law enforcement officers, skydivers, race car drivers, and other outdoor sport enthusiasts. The cameras are very small, and the recording device is lightweight and concealable. It is easy for a shooter to attach the helmet cam to their head with a ball cap, bandana, wool cap, or even a piece of string. This way, as the shooter looks down the sights of their weapon, the camera is recording almost exactly what the shooter sees. Several companies make high-quality helmet cams for three to $500. Good propaganda can also be realized with a gun-mounted camera. The Real Action Paintball Company makes a gun-mounted camera for only $200 that can be used during paintball wars or the real thing. The RAP4 Land Warrior System, which can record up to an hour of video, comes with a standard 32 megabyte memory chip, although 1 gigabyte chips are available. This camera is a standalone wireless system that can be connected directly to a TV set for viewing after the action or downloaded to a computer through a USB cable. A significant leap in sniper media technology is the new generation of rifle scopes with an integrated video camera, so the optical device is a combined scope camera. For example, SmartScope is a 3x10 variable power scope with an internal color camera that can either record video or still photos. SmartScope weighs 24 ounces, has 32 megabytes of memory, and can take excellent detailed color photos out to several hundred meters. With an integrated scope camera, the shooter does not require an additional cameraman and can film their own targets by themselves without the need for additional equipment like jury-rigged cameras. Currently, scope cameras like the Smart Scope cost about $1,000 each. Two Israeli arms companies, IREC Technologies LTD, Elbit Systems teamed up to produce the sniper control system that consists of an integrated scope camera placed up to six different sniper rifles, providing real-time feedback from the separate shooting positions to a cement central command and control station. In this manner, the sniper commander, positioned at a central location, can manage and order the simultaneous shooting of up to six separate targets. While the sniper control system allows the user to record their shots on video, the real innovation in this system is real-time imaging is relayed to a separate location. 
The natural progression from here is to beam live to millions of viewers the real-time shooting of a sniper's target. A government like Israel, which must take into account international media exposure and political pressure, would surely suffer worldwide condemnation if they aired the real-time shooting of a Palestinian gunman. However, a guerrilla organization would have no such restriction. But how could a guerrilla organization pull off such a media coup? The Israeli sniper control system is a restricted access item sold only to Israeli allied law enforcement and military communities. A guerrilla organization like Hezbollah, Hamas, or the PLO might get one through the black market or even steal one, but do they have to go through all that effort? No, they do not. In 2004, Texas entrepreneur John Lockwood established an online hunting business where people could remotely log on to his website and hunt wild game over the internet. All it took was a webcam attached to a rifle, which was in turn connected to a nearby computer, so the end user could get real-time video streaming through the rifle scope. The technology is out there. It is cheap, easily assembled, and commercially available. And it has already been done by a small-town businessman in Texas. Now it is up to a guerrilla organization to determine if they want to show real-time video streaming of their sniper attacks on the internet or not. Chances are they will not want live sniper streaming because their guerrilla media cells need time to review and edit the sniper attacks to present them in the most favorable light. However, live video recording to a remote location would ensure the sniper coverage would be saved at a location independent of the shooter. This way, the shooter would not have incriminating video recordings on their person. Even if the sniper was captured or killed, the sniper attack has already been recorded and is safe elsewhere, perhaps hundreds of miles away or even in a different country. Shoot to Thrill The exploitation of the psychology of sniping has lurched forward unpredictably over the years. The first step in maximizing the effects of sniping is to understand its psychological impact. It is better to shoot to thrill than to shoot to kill. The sniper can cause enemy casualties, but the sniper's true power is the ability to instill gut-wrenching fear that paralyzes a military organization or a civilian population. Then, this fear and hatred of the sniper can be used to spark an overreaction from the enemy, helping to alienate the population and build widespread support for the resistance. Once an organization appreciates what these deadly snipers can do, they can magnify their effects through skillful manipulation of the media. The Russians at Stalingrad appreciated the psychological impact of snipers and the benefits of advertising their feats through their media outlets. More recently, with the Iraqi insurgents' melding of sniper technology and media saturation, the guerrilla sniper has reached new heights. Today, the lone guerrilla sniper, combined with a savvy marketing machine, can produce strategic effects on the battlefield. Because of modern marketing technology like the internet and other mass market media outlets, the ability to manipulate the psychology of sniping has never been greater.